we're going to be talking about watercolor brushes as you guys can see we have an assortment of watercolor brushes and i'm going to go over those with you guys today so there are several different ways to classify watercolor brushes here we have one way we have synthetic brushes these are all brushes made with synthetic fibers like tacalon and natural hair brushes which are made from fibers like Kalinsky sable, squirrel, sometimes even goat and wolf hair, depending on what kind of brushes you're using. Synthetic brushes are going to be cheaper. They're going to be a little bit more durable, but you're going to have problems where they're not going to hold as much paint, they're not going to hold as much water, and that is because natural hair fibers have something called flags on the end. It's kind of like split ends in your hair, where the shaft of the hair will have all of these little uh, Actually, I can draw that for you a little bit more easily than I can explain. So, we have our hair, and then we have these little things that kind of come off from the hair. That's called flagging, and those are going to hold on to moisture. They're going to hold on to paint. Natural hair brushes have that. Synthetic brushes typically don't. There are a few methods you can use to kind of create those qualities with your synthetic brushes, like dragging them against sandpaper and I believe Cheap Joe's has a two minute art tip that I'll link right here for you guys but generally I personally prefer synthetic brushes I mean natural hair brushes synthetic brushes are also typically a little bit stiffer than natural hair brushes this is a synthetic quill brush for example this is a synthetic filbert and you can see there is some waviness to the fibers and that does help hold on to hair, and, I mean water and to pigment, but it's just not quite as wavy as say this very bushy natural hair squirrel brush. This is a Harmony Squirrel Quill Brush or this goat hair brush here or even this Kalinsky Sable brush will have a little bit more flagging than most synthetic brushes. So that's a quality you're gonna wanna consider. Now when you're just starting out, synthetic is going to be more affordable, it's going to be a little bit easier to use and possibly a little bit easier to control. It's also going to be easier to find. You're also not going to have to worry about accidentally purchasing a damaged synthetic brush. Most synthetic brushes, if they're damaged, it's gonna be very obvious. You're gonna notice the problem, hopefully while you're in the store. Whereas with natural hair brushes, a natural hair brush can look like it's old, ratty, and damaged when it simply needs to be cleaned, conditioned, or just wet. So I simply stuck this Kalinsky Sable brush in my mouth for a moment and you can see that it pulls a really nice point. Now, natural hair brushes are generally going to be more expensive than synthetic brushes. Kalinsky Sable is typically the most exp expensive fiber because it's a little bit harder to come by and the uh, they're actually a type of mink that they're harvested from but those only come from a certain part of Russia and they have to be collected in a certain fashion so you know it is going to drive the price up also there are some people who have ethical concerns for towards using natural hair fibers and prefer to use synthetic brushes so in the end what you choose to use is going to come down to what you can afford what your ethically, emotionally, morally all right with using, and what you find easier to use. So synthetic versus natural hair brushes is one division. Another division is going to be type of brush. We have here a mop. This is used to apply a lot of water, a lot of paint to a larger area. We have a flat or a filbert. This one has been curved. This one is very useful for applying larger washes because it's a larger brush. We have a quill. Quills are generally larger but shaped very similarly to rounds. It is also usually sort of tied off with these sort of metal bands. Most quills will have that feature. We have your basic round. We have what is known as a scrubber brush and this typically has short very stiff fibers and it's used to lift and scrub up paint. We have an angled shader brush. We have another flat brush and we have here a synthetic sumi brush. So these were all synthetics. You can get a lot of variety. Most of these are going to be analogous with uh, natural hair brushes as well. So for example, we have 
Sumi brushes. We have, um, I believe this one is, and I'm probably wrong, it looks like Weasel with goat hair, and then this one is probably goat hair, and then we have synthetic. We have a synthetic quill, and we have a squirrel hair quill. We have a synthetic round, and we have a natural round. And for larger brushes, I typically just buy synthetics because that's what's generally more economical. Now, as a watercolor comic illustrator, most of my work is fairly detailed, fairly rendered. I rely most heavily on a variety of rounds, but I also use mops and the occasional filbert. The type of watercolor you do is going to kind of dictate what sort of materials you purchase. So, now that you guys kind of understand the basics of brushes, why don't we start demonstrating them? For this demonstration, I am using the Da Vinci Artist Colors Mixing Set in whole pans. I really like this set. It's kind of a basic set of 12 colors, but I really enjoy the quality of this set. You guys can check out a review by clicking on the card here. I also have Fluid 100 Cotton Rag Watercolor Paper, and in another video I will demonstrate the differences between your typical cellulose paper and your typical cotton rag paper. And we're just going to start doing a one-to-one -one comparison with each of the brushes. Now, I do not own any natural hair mop brushes. This is a Cotman synthetic brush, and this is what I would recommend you use, just because they're very economical and they perform quite well. So as I said, a mop is really designed to cover large areas. It can also be used to add a lot of water to your paper as well. So we get a really nice, gentle sort of transition with the mop. So that was our mop brush. Next we have my softer synthetic um, it's kind of a filbert, but it's a little bit softer than a filbert. Filberts are also called a cat's tongue. It's due to the shape, the sort of oval shape it has. And this would be a Creative Mark Mimic filbert, filbert in three-fourths of an inch. This one is a little bit softer than your typical flat brush, I would say. That one is not quite as wet. This is a technique called dry brushing. It is something that many artists do actually want. But if you add more water, you get rid of the dry brush technique and it gives you kind of a softer transition. You can also hold your flats and filberts in another orientation and do very thin lines as well. So that was a synthetic filbert. Next, we're going to do a synthetic flat. And this one is a Cotman synthetic flat. It's a little bit stiffer than our Filbert. So this can be used to kind of apply harder edges if you wish. You can also do thin lines by changing the orientation of the brush. Or if you add more water, you can use this to apply a wash. So that was a synthetic flat. It does not have the taper the way a filbert would have. Next, we're going to take a look at an angled shader brush. And this is a Princeton Velvet Touch angled shader. Often synthetic brushes can also be used for mixed media techniques, so you can also use them with acrylics. An angled shader can also get a very fine thin point. Or you can do thick and thin lines using just the tip. So depending on the type of illustration you do or the type of watercolor you do, 
These can be very versatile, useful brushes for you. So that was a synthetic angled shader. Next, we have a synthetic Sumi brush. These are made by, or the one I have is made by Pintel. This is very similar to a large round. It's a little bit longer than your typical round though. And these can be good for kind of doing more detailed areas, perhaps filling in unusually shaped areas. Or if you enjoy being a little bit more calligraphic with your strokes, you can use them for more expressive mark making like this. So that is a synthetic Sumi brush. Then I have a synthetic round and I highly recommend if you are amassing a collection of watercolor tools that you get all of your larger rounds in synthetic fibers. They just tend to be a bit more affordable. Rounds come in various sizes and the smallest can be quadruple zero. The largest can be like 36. I don't own anything quite as large as 36. I believe the largest I own is a 10, which I'll show you in a moment. But rounds can be really good for filling in details, but they're not necessarily good for covering large areas of the paper. So this is a size eight round made by Utrecht and different companies make rounds in different sizes. It's a bit like buying women's pants. A size six is not a size six in every brand. Synthetics can also vary pretty greatly in quality from extremely cheap to brushes that are actively trying to emulate natural fibers. So. In this hand, I have several very cheap brushes. We have a Crayola 1000 brush. We have a plaid synthetic brush. We have a Princeton Snap synthetic brush, and we have a Caran d'Ache synthetic brush. And as you guys can see, if you look very carefully, their sizes are printed. So this is a size seven in Crayola. This is a size 12 for plaid. This is a size 10 for Princeton, and this is a size eight for Caran d'Ache. So they all are kind of doing their own thing in terms of sizes. Now, very, very cheap synthetic brushes can still be useful, but they tend to be a little bit more scrubby than nicer synthetic brushes, and they don't hold onto the pigments quite as well as nicer synthetic brushes. And synthetic brushes are generally very, very cheap anyway. So there's no point to me in buying, say, a 50 pack of really cheap synthetic brushes when you could just have one or two good synthetic brushes that are going to cost less than the pack of 50 and are going to perform so much better and they're going to last you so much longer. Now, if you really are on a tight budget, Princeton Snap brushes are quite economical and they perform decently well. One of the problems that I have with synthetic brushes overall is they have a tendency to drip and drop paint and pigment onto your paper because they lack the flags to hold onto water and onto pigment. So that was our four inexpensive synthetic brushes. They were all rounds and you can tell that it's a round brush because the bristles are shaped into a round shape and come to a point. Now I'm going to demonstrate a synthetic quill. The one I have here is made by Silver. It's an Atelier Golden Tacalon Quill. And I really don't like this brush because it's very, very drippy. Now it can hold a lot of water and it will drip a lot of water. Quills can be useful though. If you don't have a mop, they can also kind of uh, cover a larger area. But something I also don't like about this one is you see how the knots, the, the knots in the wire, they're all kind of you have three here and one here, and it's already dripping all over my hands. I apologize. Um, these will tear into my skin. So I hold my brush too high up. You want to hold it further back, but I tend to hold it just a bit too high up. So we have a Pintel Synthetic Sumi brush. We have several 
inexpensive rounds. And then we have, let me move it so you guys can see it. We have a large synthetic quill. When these dries, I'm gonna demonstrate how to use a synthetic scrubber brush. A scrubber brush like this one, the silver scrubble, scrubber, this is an oval or a flat, or an oval flat, you can see it's a little bit thicker, a little bit rounder than your typical filbert. These are used, I'm gonna dip it in my water, these are used to help lift or scrub away color you no longer want on the paper. So again, we are working on a cellulose paper, which is a little bit nicer than cotton rag. You see how if I very, very gently scrub on the dry watercolor, it'll start to lift it up. You wanna be really gentle because these fibers can be very harsh and scrubby. That's what they do. So we're gonna let that finish drying. Now you don't have to use a scrubber brush to lift your watercolors. In fact, I very, very rarely use this scrubber brush, but I did want to demonstrate it for you guys. You can also, let me clean that out. You can also just use a, and I like to use synthetic brushes for this one. I have an inexpensive Caran d'Ache synthetic brush here. I'm applying it to the paper. I'm just kind of wetting the area I'm gonna want to lift. And then I apply my paper towel to lift it up and you see it lifted well my camera may not even be able to pick it up but it does lift a little bit and if you continue to work the area you will be able to get it to lift with less damage to the paper so that's kind of an overview of my synthetic brushes next we're going to move on to natural hair brushes Natural hair brushes are typically more expensive than synthetic brushes. A good middle of the road approach is something referred to as red sable or the types of brushes that silver makes. These are mixed brushes. So silver is a combination of synthetic with squirrel hair. Red sable can be a combination of golden tacklon synthetic with Kalinsky sable or other natural fibers. There is a bit of a hierarchy to the quality of fibers used in natural hair brushes. We have camel, which is the cheapest one. That's the one that's typically used for children's brushes. And that's actually pony hair. It's very stiff, coarse, can be very difficult to work with. Then we have squirrel, which can vary a lot in quality as well. So we have here a very beaten up and expensive Creative Mark squirrel round. And I also have, actually here's another one, also very beaten up. And I will grab a Blick Master Squirrel brush just to help compare the difference between the two. And here I have a couple of Blick Master Squirrel brushes. I've had these for several years. They have been through hell and back, but they're still in fairly good shape. My cat has even chewed on them, but with regular care and conditioning, and I have a video on how to take care of your watercolor brushes here, but with regular care and conditioning, they've held up quite well. My less expensive Creative Mark brushes do not fare quite as well. So even within Squirrel, there's a fair amount of quality variance. Another very popular fiber that is kind of considered like the cream of the crop would be Kalinsky Sable. And Kalinsky Sable fibers are a little bit longer. They're a little bit smoother. They tend to come to a point a little bit better. And you can get Kalinsky Sable through several brands. Creative Mark makes a Kalinsky Sable brush. Windsor & Newton makes a uh, Kalinsky Sable brush. And Princeton makes a pretty decent uh, Kalinsky Sable brush. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start demonstrating these brushes for you guys. Most of the brushes in my collection that are natural hair brushes are going to be round because I paint watercolor comics. So that's, you know, they're the most useful for what I'm doing. So I'm going to begin with a Sumi brush. Sumi brushes are typically inexpensive and they are generally made with natural fibers. There's a variety of fibers that they're available in. In fact, you can get Kalinsky Sable ones as well and Weasel. As I demonstrated with the synthetic Pentel, you can use them very much like you would use a round to kind of fill in more detail areas, but you can also use them for dry brush techniques like this, or even if they're very wet to fill in larger areas like a wash. 
So a Sumi brush can be a very versatile addition to your watercolor collection and it's a very inexpensive one as well. Now there's a variety of hair types used for these sort of brushes from pony hair to um, squirrel hair, wolf hair, goat hair, weasel hair. So they all kind of deliver different properties. Pony hair tends to be a little bit stiffer whereas softer fibers can be a little bit more difficult to control. So it's really about finding the product that's going to work for you and is gonna give you the kind of results that you want. You can also get, I think this is a Boko Undo brush, but this is typically used by mangaka to ink their comics or to help with inking their comics. So you can even get very fine ones. Now that picked up a lot too much paint. I'm not mixing things very properly. And with care and with practice, a $13 Boko Undo brush will perform as well as a $30 Winsor Newton Series 7 brush. But it's gonna come down to your preference, what you're comfortable with, and where you are on your journey. So those were all Sumi brushes. I have a couple more here. This is, I believe, a very, very small Menso brush. And this is designed for doing outlines in a specific type of Chinese watercolor. So this can be really good for fine, small details. It can also be useful for inking. But really, one of the biggest problems I see many new artist, watercolor artists doing is they will use too small a brush for the area they're trying to fill. Always try to work a little with a brush a little bit larger than you would typically be comfortable using. So that was kind of an exploration of just a few of the many different types of Sumi brushes. Here's a really inexpensive one by Asutomo. It has a tendency to shed all over the place. So that's why it's not one of my favorites. You can also use a brush called a hake brush, which look like these. And in a moment after this dries, I will show you the sort of marks hake brushes can use, but these are typically used to cover larger areas. So I have a couple of hake brushes. This is a one inch hake brush made by Utrecht. And this is a half inch hake brush. And you can see that they have stiffer fibers. These may be made from goat hair. And if you watch say traditional Japanese or Chinese watercolor painting on YouTube, you will notice that the artists use these kind of brushes frequently. So. They're fairly inexpensive if you can find them. And they're really good for covering large areas like doing backgrounds. You can also use them for like more gestural painting as well. So that is the one inch hockey brush. Here is the half inch hockey brush. I'm not gonna get it as wet because I'm gonna demonstrate a bit of dry brush technique with you guys. Now the problem is that these kind of brushes can be prone to shedding. So I just want you all to keep that in mind that you may be pulling some bristles out of your paint. So this would be like a soft sort of dry brush effect. can then go over that with water just to kind of blend it out a bit. And if you're interested in learning more watercolor techniques or kind of getting the basics for watercolor techniques, I have a video here that will walk you through, I think it's like the six most commonly used techniques. So if when I say wet into wet, you're like, what, wet into what? You should check that video out. So that's just a quick demonstration of what hake brushes can do. While I wait for this to dry, I'm going to use the same one inch hake brush and show you that you can quickly kind of create a wash effect by adding a darker layer into your layer, a more saturated layer of color, or you can even add another layer of color into your watercolor. 
So while I've got you guys, you see how there's a lot of excess water pulled up right there? There's a couple of different ways you can solve that if you want to, you know, pick up the extra water. You can take a paper towel and twist it up and just lightly dab it in. Don't actually touch the paper surface. And as you guys will see, it sucks up a lot of the extra water. And that's going to result in a quicker t dry time. Or you can do something called a thirsty brush, which is where we take a wet brush we damp it off with a paper towel. That makes it thirsty. The fibers are more likely to absorb water now. And then we can just glide it through our puddle. Rinse and kind of repeat. So those are a couple of really easy watercolor techniques for just picking up excess water. I know that's something that a lot of artists do kind of struggle with as they're learning the ropes. Next, we're going to play around with a variety of mixed fiber and natural hair brushes. Most of these are rounds. So we're going to begin with Squirrel. And we have here a Harmony Squirrel Quill. This was made by Creative Mark. So natural hair quills are very similar to synthetic quills in that they can be very useful for applying a lot of paint. You see this area here, that's called the belly of the brush, the rounded area. That's what's gonna hold a lot of your paint and a lot of your water. So quills can be used for expressive brush strokes. They can be used, especially the natural hair ones, which are gonna really cling on to the water and paint. They can be used to do finer, smaller areas if you wish. They can be used for, say, brush calligraphy with watercolor. They can be loaded with two different colors. Well, I chose two reds. Let's grab, let's grab a yellow. And you can get some on the brush color blending going on. They can also be used to create a wash over a smaller area. So a couple of natural hair quills, although they're a little bit expensive, can be a really versatile addition to your watercolor brush collection and can really give you a lot of options. So next we're going to take a look at some squirrel hair brushes and I have here a round squirrel by Creative Mark. You can see it's seen better days. Squirrel is a very soft natural fiber. So if you were doing a technique like glazing where you're applying a very thin wash of color over an existing color or selection of colors like I would do for my seven inch carrot pages when I'm adding like shadow colors, um, it's very gentle. It's not really gonna scrub the pigments underneath. So it can be a very gentle way to apply a large area of the same color to tone the color underneath. Squirrel is also typically much cheaper than Kalinsky Sable, but it can be much more difficult to control. So if you have shaky hands or if you're really uncertain about watercolor, it's probably best to avoid squirrel because it can be very frustrating to use. Higher quality squirrel brushes though do perform better than their cheaper counterparts. And this would be a Blick Master. I think I talked to you guys about that one a little bit earlier on in the video and it's taken my abuse much better than um, than its creative mark counterparts so squirrel is kind of the workhorse for my personal watercolor collection. Um, I have a lot of squirrel brushes, but I also have a lot of Kalinsky Sable and not all Kalinsky Sable is made equally. So I have here some Blick brushes. These were a collaboration with Winsor & Newton, I believe. Well, these are made by Winsor & Newton, but I believe they were a collaboration with Blick. And I don't like them as much as I like some of my other Sable brushes. They're a little bit stiff. They're a little bit dry. Um, they were not cut very well. They were not shaped very well when I purchased them. 
So I use those very rarely and I'm not very satisfied with the quality. The ones I do like are Winsor Newton Series 7. This is a size 5. It was given to me as a Christmas gift one year and it's kind of my prized possession. I really love this brush. It performs quite well. Um, this was, however, one of their older brushes and I've just kind of had it for a long time. And um, I try to take good care of it and clean it frequently and not allow paints to dry up in the ferrule, which will ruin it. This is a much cheaper Creative Mark Rhapsody. This is a round that is Kalinsky Sable, as you guys can see. This is a size 5. This is a size 4. Um, and like we talked about earlier, different brands will have different sizes, just like with jeans. So um, this, I've noticed though that the Creative Mark all of their brushes are just shorter than others so if you have control issues this is not only cheaper than the series 7 but they're much shorter and they used to be my preference for inking brushes as I have hand tremors and these are a little bit easier for me to control now mind of watercolor talks about using um, riggers and liners which are very long kind of brushes for like inking esque watercolor techniques he says that the longer brush kind of helps distribute those tremors so they're not so noticeable. So this could be a your mileage may vary situation. I've never had much luck with them myself, but we have very different backgrounds. So um, perhaps his use case, they're a little bit better. Now Princeton has recently started making a Kalinsky Sable brush and this is the 7050R and it's pretty good too. And it's a bit cheaper, quite a bit cheaper than the Series 7 brush. And you may be able to find these a little bit more easily. So let me just organize everything. But really it's going to boil down to what you're comfortable with and maybe even what you have access to. If you don't have access to certain brands, you're probably not going to be able to buy those brands. So you're going to have to buy alternatives. If your local art store doesn't carry one thing, you may have to try using another. And while I realize to some of the older artists and the more experienced artists this might seem like common sense, common knowledge, but really all I'm telling you is um, work with what you have and work with what you have access to. Don't worry too much about doing what everyone else does. Everything I'm saying in my videos, it's um, based on my own experiences and my own painting preferences. I paint watercolor comics and watercolor illustration, not really fine art or traditional watercolor. So how I use watercolors is very different from how other artists use watercolors. So one of my new favorites are the silver black velvet brushes. These are a mixture of synthetic fibers and squirrel fibers. I find them they can be expensive depending on where you get them, but I find that they're rugged little little brushes. They behave quite nicely for mixed fiber brushes. They're easy to care for and they do what I ask them to do. They can cover large areas, they can co cover tiny areas, they can do details decently well and um, they're not particularly finicky. I don't really have to go to a lot of trouble to uh, condition them or take care of them or maintain them. So I really happen to like these black silver brushes and I would recommend getting the black silver brushes over say a variety of synthetic brushes. But over the years that I've been painting, I find that I use synthetic brushes a lot and I use natural fiber brushes a lot. So I think of it as kind of an investment and a bit of a collection. But I really like these brushes and if you get the chance to try them, I highly recommend you do. Okay, so what brushes do I recommend if you're just starting out and you want to paint watercolor illustrations or watercolor comics? I recommend you start with a mop. This is a Cotman 999. This is a large synthetic mop. It is 19 millimeters. And as we talked about much earlier, mops are great for covering larger areas very quickly. I use these all the time to tone my watercolor illustrations and to tone my seven inch carapages. So this would be a mop. I recommend you get a mop. I also recommend you get a large synthetic filbert. I use this in lieu of using a mop for some of my smaller watercolor illustrations where I still need to care cover a large area on the paper, but it's not quite as large as a 14 by 10 watercolor comic page. It's more like, I don't know, a five by seven watercolor illustration. So this is a 
Creative Mark Mimic Filbert in 3 fourths of an inch. So I recommend you get a synthetic filbert like this one. I recommend you get at least one squirrel quill. This is a Creative Mark Harmony squirrel quill. They're fairly inexpensive through Jerry's Artorama. And as we discussed earlier, quills can be super versatile. You can use it very much like a mop. You can use it for more detailed fills or filling in smaller areas. You can also, if you get a squirrel mop, use it to do glazes on top of areas of color. So quills, especially squirrel quills, I kept keep wanting to call it squills, quills are a recommended addition to your watercolor brush collection. I also recommend you buy some sumi brushes and some Chinese watercolor brushes. They're very economical. You can get them with a variety of hairs and they are a great natural hair substitute for your typical Western round watercolor brush. Um, I see them everywhere from $4 to $7 and a little bit more expensive than that. But you can use these for filling in larger areas. You can use them for filling in smaller detailed areas. Once you get used to using Sumi brushes, they are a phenomenal addition to your watercolor collection. They're also available in a variety of sizes. You can get hockey brushes, as we talked about earlier. You can get pony hair, you can get wolf hair, you can get weasel hair, you can get um, kind of stronger, sharper hairs, you can get softer, more delicate hairs. So. Really, Sumi brushes kind of cover the whole gamut. You don't necessarily have to get other types of watercolor brushes. Now, my only problem with Sumi brushes is that I personally find them a little bit harder to control, so I don't like using them for my watercolor comic pages. My main workhorse for my comic pages are rounds. You see here a 26 round. It is a synthetic brush, of course, because I cannot afford a 26 in natural hair, but that's okay because at this size, you're not really going to notice much of a difference. Now this is kind of a shorter, fatter round. It can hold a lot of water and it's not particularly prone to dripping or some of the other problems I've noticed in synthetics, perhaps because larger brushes can have a larger belly. So they have a larger reservoir to hold your paint. So I would recommend if you're going to get larger rounds, and I do recommend that you get larger rounds, that you get larger synthetic rounds like this Creative Mark Mimic in size 26. Now from this point, it's going to be your personal preference, but I do recommend you get a few squirrel brushes if only for glazing. Squirrel can be quite affordable, quite economical, and quite soft. So you can do some really sort of delicate wet into wet work with a soft squirrel brush or you can use it for your glazes. I also recommend you get a mixed content brush like the Silver Black Velvet. This is squirrel and synthetic fiber. It's a little bit um, stiffer than your normal squirrel brush and it's really quite a resilient little brush that comes to a lovely point. I also recommend that you get Kalinsky Sable brushes. Now, as we discussed way earlier, this may come down to ethical and moral preferences. If you have a problem using animal fibers in your work, animal products in your work, you may want to avoid these and just stick to your synthetics. This is a Creative Mark Rhapsody Klimsky Sable in size 4. I do recommend you get a size 4 um, in natural hair just because it's going to have different working properties than a synthetic 4. And I just happen to really like how they handle. I also recommend, especially if you do watercolor comics or illustrations that are very detail heavy, you get some very small brushes. Now these are a couple of zeros in Creative Mark Rhapsody, so the Kalinsky Sable. But I also highly recommend you get some synthetics in smaller sizes too because when you're working this small, and if you want to draw like details, like if you want to draw eyelashes or wisps of hair, something like that, you're going to need a brush that can kind of stand up to your paint. And I really like using uh, synthetic brushes if I'm working with metallic paints, like the Fine Tech paints, or if I'm working with white gouache, or if I'm working with um, dry brush. So a very, very dry brush applying a very heavy pigment load. Synthetic brushes are great for that. 
because they can kind of stand up to it. They're stiff enough to stand up to it. You wouldn't be able to get the same effect with a squirrel brush that you would with even a cheap synthetic for when it comes to this sort of application. We're applying a lot of pigment to the page. So, I hope this was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. I recorded this video to help me prepare for my watercolor panel at MTAC and to give me an opportunity to take photos of the products that I own and the products that I recommend along with their demonstrations. If you like what I do and you live in the Nashville area, I would love it if you could sign up for my workshop mailing list. I send out information when I teach workshops here in the Nashville area. I have taught for various conventions. I am teaching for Nashville Community Ed, and I am about to begin teaching for Plaza. So if you're in the Nashville area and you enjoy what I do and you'd like to come take a class in person, sign up for that mailing list. If you want to support what I do and you live far away, consider joining my Patreon by becoming an art nerd. You help me fund projects like this. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I ended up using like six sheets of cotton rag watercolor paper for this demonstration alone. That's half a pad. That gets really expensive. So your support over on Patreon enables me to record these sort of videos so that you guys can learn at a very economical price point. And if you can't afford to do that, tell the world that you love what I do. Share it on Twitter, on Facebook, on all your favorite social medias, and leave a comment letting me know how much you enjoy my content. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful, useful, and informative for you guys. If you have any further questions about watercolor brushes, I have additional resources that I have linked throughout the video, and that will be linked in the description below. Please check those, and then, if I still haven't answered your question, let me know in the comments. I would love to answer your questions, help you out. It gives me a chance to know what you guys don't know, so I can better address it in future videos, and it allows you the chance to learn something new. So, thank you guys so much for watching. I can't wait to see you guys in the near future with another fantastic tutorial. Bye guys!